MC today is a good friend of mine and a good friend of the library. He's an influential leader in the community and someone that, quite frankly, I, I, I look up to as, as, as a leader. Uh, Wayne Scott is a senior program manager at Raytheon Company in Fullerton, California, currently serving as manager of the U.S. Navy's Joint Precision Approach and Landing System Program. I've looked into this system a little bit, and it's pretty incredible to see how sophisticated these, these, these things operate, uh, and, and, and Wayne makes that happen. Before joining Raytheon, Wayne served nearly three decades as a communications and computer systems officer in the United States Air Force. His Air Force career took him through 19 different assignments at 11 different locations, including three tours as a squadron commander responsible for the morale, welfare, and discipline of up to 500 personnel. <laughs> Under his leadership, one of those units was named the best large communications unit in the Air Force. That one I will. He retired as a colonel from the Air Force in November 2005 and joined Raytheon. Since his military retirement, Wayne has been, an acti has been active in veteran activities, activities across Southern California. He is on the board of directors of the Yorba Linda Veterans Memorial Association and plays a lead role in the association's annual Memorial Day and Veterans Day ceremonies at the Yorba Linda Veterans Memorial, where they honor local veterans and Gold Star families across Orange County. Wayne is an active member of the American Legion, the Air Force Association, and the Armed Forces Communications and Electronics Association. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Colonel Wayne Scott. I think he looks up to me because I'm taller. Uh, it's Veterans Day. I started my day by going to Dunkin' Donuts and getting my free donuts, so I am just fired up and ready for the day. As Chris mentioned, I'm Colonel Wayne Scott, United States Air Force retired, and I'm honored to serve as Master of Ceremonies for today's Veterans Day event. Uh, President Nixon himself was a veteran, having served as a naval officer during World War II before returning to Whittier, California to begin his political career. This library has regularly celebrated military and veterans events since it opened in 1990, and we have a very special Veterans Day ceremony today. Veterans Day, formerly known as Armistice Day, was originally set as a US legal holiday to honor the end of World War I, and officially took place on 11 November 1918, 99 years ago today. In 1938, 11 November was, quote, dedicated to the cause of world peace and to, who after, and to be hereafter celebrated and known as Armistice Day. As such, the new legal holiday honored World War I veterans. In 1954, after having been through both World War II and Korea, the 83rd U.S. Congress, at the urging of veteran service organizations like our American Legion, amended the act of 1938 by striking out the word armistice and inserting the word veterans. With the approval of this legislation on 1 June 1954, November 11th became a day to honor American veterans of all wars. Each Veterans Day should be a time when Americans stop and remember the brave men and women who have risked their lives for the United States of America. As Dwight Eisenhower said, Quote, it is well for us to pause and to acknowledge our debt to those who paid so large a share of freedom's price. As we stand here in grateful remembrance of the veterans' contributions, we renew our conviction of individual responsibility to live in ways that support the eternal truths upon which our nation is founded and from which flows all its strength and its greatness. In just a moment, we will begin our ceremony with a presentation of colors by the California State Military Reserve Color Guard from Joint Forces Training Base Los Alamitos. Once the color guard is in place, our national anthem will be sung by Alexandra Rupp. Ladies and gentlemen, please rise. March on the colors.
say, can you see by the dawn's early light what so proudly we held at the twilight's last gleaming who's brought stripes and bright stars through the perilous fight o'er the ramparts we watched were so gallantly streaming and the rocket's red glare the bombs bursting I would now like to invite Navy Chaplain, Captain Terry Gordon from the U.S. Navy Region Southwest to offer our invocation. Captain. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, for 98 years we Americans as a people have remembered those who served our country in uniform, designating the 11th of November as the day we pay our respects. From that first observance as Armistice Day, and then since 1954 as Veterans Day, today on this Veterans Day, we honor and thank all those who have served in the United States Armed Forces and remember the families who support them all. We acknowledge the lives of sacrifice and their examples of service. We honor their love and devotion both to their country and for each other. May we always be mindful that even today, men and women of our great nation stand the watch for our country. May we never forget the price that is paid by these guardians of freedom. Protect them, Lord, and may you continue to bless our great nation. For it's in your holy name that I pray, amen. Thank you, Chaplain Gordon. Ladies and gentlemen, please be seated. I would like to begin by welcoming several special guests we have with us today. Our host, the president of the Richard Nixon Foundation, Mr. Bill Baraboff. <laughs> From California's 39th Congressional District, United States Representative Ed Royce. From Camp Pendleton, commander of the 11th Marine Expeditionary Unit, Colonel Frederick Fredrickson and his wife, Lisa. From the city of Yorba Linda, city council member, Tom Lindsay. And city council member, Tara Campbell.
and World War II veteran, author, and our guest speaker today, U.S. Army Air Force's Captain Jerry Yellen. <laughs> I would also like to recognize the most important VIPs here today. First, would any members of the greatest generation, those who served our nation during World War II, please stand and be recognized. Over 16 million of them served in world, in world War II. That is why we refer to them as the greatest generation. 95% of them are no longer with us. So to have three of them here today is a great honor. Now, with all who have served our nation as members of the U.S. Armed Forces, the veterans, please stand and be recognized. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. I am honored to be counted among you. Uh, as you entered our uh, East Room today, you were enjoying the wonderful music of the Villa Park High School Concert Ensemble led by Chuck J. We now invite the Orange County High School, excuse me, the Orange High School Concert Choir led by Mike Short to share a special musical number with us.
Congressman Ed Royce has a strong history of public service. He authored the nation's first anti-stalker law as a California state senator, and versions of his bill has been, have been adopted in all 50 states. He was also the legislative author and campaign co-chair of California's Proposition 115, the Crime Victims Speedy Trial Initiative, approved by the voters in 1990. In Congress, Royce continues his fight for victims' rights. He wrote and passed the Interstate Stalking Punishment and Prevention Act in 1996. This law makes it a federal crime to pursue a victim across state lines and enables law enforcement to intervene before violence occurs. Since 2013, Royce has served as chairman of the House, Arms, uh, excuse me, House Foreign Affairs Committee, is one of our nation's premier representatives to foreign governments around the world, and is a strong advocate of foreign policy that keeps American homelands safe. The Washington Post really recently named him one of the most effective lawmakers in the US Congress. We also know him as a strong supporter of veterans. Ladies and gentlemen, Congressman Royce. Well, Colonel Scott, uh, thank you. Thank you very much for that. And uh, I, I'm here today to uh, recognize and thank all of our veterans uh, who have served, 21 million veterans uh, in this country who have served to defend this country. I, I have to tell you that in terms of my responsibilities as chairman of the Foreign Affairs Committee, when we're overseas and we see whether it's the Marines uh, that are guarding those embassies uh, and consulates around the world or whether we're we're visiting with the airmen and uh, with the sailors and soldiers uh, deployed across the world. It is a constant reminder of the magnitude of the sacrifice that they are making. And the important thing I think for us to remember is that these are not just soldiers that we're talking with. These men and women are frankly volunteers. They are really citizens that believed in our freedoms enough that they decided to risk their lives for people that they would never meet. They have sacrificed everything so that we may live in a nation where we have the freedom to express our political and religious views without fear of retaliation. And this is especially important to remember now when so many Christians around the world are facing religious persecution. But it's religious persecution of all faiths that we recognize here in this country, which largely was driven by this concept that was enshrined in that First Amendment, freedom of speech, freedom of religion. That represents an, a nation that is founded on an ideal, and it's these veterans that have stepped forward to defend that ideal. And for me, as I'm sure it is for many of you, the sacrifices that our veterans make is a personal one. Uh, my father served with General Patton's Third Army in the Second World War, and uh, from the hedgerow countries through the drive across France into, into Germany, it was what, uh, what he saw, and especially at the end of that long campaign in the war, uh, at the outskirts of Dachau. He was a Ford observer, so he had a, a jeep at his disposal, and he took that up to, to Dachau, the camp, when it was being liberated, and he took photographs there of what he saw that day. Uh, the bodies stacked up by the ovens like cordwood, and the the bodies in the rail cars and in the, uh, in the trenches that had been slaughtered in that Holocaust. And that was a reminder that as we as a nation have stood for liberty, there are others on this planet, there are other leaders who attempt to annihilate that concept. They have a totalitarian impulse, and in many cases, they're deadly serious when they talk about what they intend to do uh, in order to, to take power. And that's why U.S. leadership is so important. And while the world may be different today in many ways, 
the challenges are as great. The challenges in terms of those who do not believe in these same values that we hold. And so it is our, our veterans that continue to stand for justice and compassion and for liberty. No Americans have sacrificed more than the veterans we honor today. No one could ask more of them. And it is not just these veterans that are making that sacrifice. It is their families. It is their husbands and wives who are making that sacrifice as they're out on the front lines. All have given up time with their family. But some have sacrificed their health, their well-being, and of course their very lives. And as a community, we have a responsibility to our veterans and must take action when they're not being treated fairly or taken care of as was promised. I would also just say, in closing, a just special thank you to the, not just the veterans, the, act, the active military personnel, and also to the families. I want to say to those families, thank you for what you endure as well for these freedoms. And many of those families are here with us this morning. And I think each of us should challenge our families to remember not just one day a year during Veterans Day, but an ongoing, on an ongoing basis. And these young people who are here with us today should reflect on the enormity of the sacrifice of these citizens who have put themselves in harm's way for the ideals that this republic was founded on and for the ideals which, which America today still stands as a symbol for the rest of the globe. So we pray that God bless our veterans and God bless the United States of America and thank you and thank you for being here on Veterans Day. Our choir and band have another special number for us, a special tribute to our military. Veterans, we encourage you to stand and be recognized when your service song is played.
As we were downstairs getting ready to start the ceremony, Captain Yellen was asking me, do I stand for the Army? Or do I stand for the Air Force? Because he was in the Army Air Forces. I said, sir, you're 93 years old. You can stand for anybody you want to. Captain Jerry Yellen is an Army Air Forces veteran who served in World War II between 1941 and 1945. He enlisted on his 18th birthday just two months after the bombing of Pearl Harbor. After graduating from Luke Army Airfield as a fighter pilot in August of 1943, at the ripe old age of 19, he spent the remainder of the war flying P-40, P-47 and P-51 combat missions in the Pacific with the 78th Fighter Squadron. He participated in the first land-based fighter mission over Japan on Severin April 1945 and has the unique distinction of having flown the final combat mission of World War II on 14 August 1945, the day combat ended. On that mission, his wingman, Philip Schlomberg, was the last man killed in a combat mission in World War II. His experiences as a fighter pilot in the Pacific Theater are captured in his book, The Last Fighter Pilot, published earlier this year. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to our platform, recipient of the Distinguished Flying Cross, the Air Medal with three oak leaf clusters, World War II veteran and fighter pilot, Captain Jerry Yellen. Thank you, sir. Uh, I have to begin by saying this is an unbelievable honor for me. The, uh, uh, throughout my Air Force career, I was constantly reminded that the Air Force that I served in stood on the shoulders of giants. And those giants were the men, and no apologies to the women present, but in World War II, there were no women in combat. Not that none served. But you and your generation, properly referred to as the greatest generation, set the standard for what it means to fly, fight, and win which is the basis of what is today the world's greatest Air Force that I proudly served in. You gave us a warrior ethos that defines who we are. And I'm talking about it from an Air Force perspective, but that same ethos, those same standards are present across all of our military services. And it's because of men like Jerry Yellen and, and, and your generation that gave that to us, and I thank you. And so I'm just so honored to be up here with you. We had talked about some questions we were going to go through, but I, I've got to I've got to start with one. The uh, it talked in the bio about you flew P40s, P47s, P51s. Um, I'm the son of a naval aviator. My dad would tell me that the F4U Corsair is the greatest fighter aircraft ever built. I got a soft spot in my heart for the P-51. Every time I flew, see one flying, I am just, just absolutely in awe. You got to tell us, what was it like flying the P-51 Mustang? We, uh, we learned to fly on a 220 horsepower Stearman, and then a 400 horsepower Paul T vibrator, and then a 600 horsepower AT6. 
each one of those airplanes you flew with an instructor. And then we got into a P-40, uh, which was a fighter plane being used by General Chenault in China against the Japanese. And then we got the P-47, which we called the Jug. <coughs> Hard airplane to fly, that mushed, that wasn't instantaneous control. And then we got the finest airplane that ever was built, the P-51 Mustang. And you could fly that with your fingertips. The sound of it, the feeling of instant response with anything that you wanted to do. That was what the P-51 was about. Still the best airplane. I would agree with you. <laughs> I made reference during the bio to, to your book. I've got a copy of it here. We're going to be talking at the end about the availability of this in our bookstore, and, and Captain Yellen is going to be available to, uh, to uh, autograph copies of the book. Um, you, in the book, you share your experiences as a fighter pilot in the Pacific during World War II. Uh, I think to start with, and, and, and although the book ends with it, but walk us through that, that last mission. Okay, the last fighter pilot, the last mission, August 14, 1945. We, uh, I landed on Iwo Jima on August 6th, the day that the first atomic bomb was dropped from Hiroshima. And my prop was still spinning, spinning. And a squadron mate, Phil Marr from Brooklyn, jumped on my wing and said, we dropped one bomb, wiped out a city. I said, what are you drinking? I want some, you know, it's hard to believe. But it was true. And then on August 9th, 1945, the second bomb was dropped on Nagasaki. But we thought the war was over. We, we would not fly any more missions. At that point in time, I had flown with 15 guys who were killed. I never thought about them as being dead. They were transferred. We'd see them again someday. And we were called to a briefing on August 13th, a room this size with 100 and some, 100 plus pilots and told that we we're gonna fly a, a final mission, another mission. And someone asked Jim Tapp, who was our CO, why are we going to Japan again? And he said, well, the Japs are negotiating, but there's no movement. We have to go and keep them honest. But they're gonna broadcast the code word Utah to abort the mission. We'll hear that, we won't go to Japan. When that was said, Phil Schlomberg, 19 years old, leaned over to me and said, Captain, if we go on this list mission, I'm not coming back. And I said, what are you talking about? He says, it's a feeling I have. I went to TAP and told him what Phil Schlomberg told me. And he told me, you cannot go to Doc Lewis, the flight surgeon, but if Phil will go, he might get off the mission. I told that to Schlomberg. He said, no way. Early on the morning of August 14th, I said, Phil, get on my wing and don't get off. Just stick in close. We're never going to make it to Japan. So we flew all the way to a drop tank where we had to drop our external tanks. We dropped our tanks, and we went in a strafe airfields somewhere in Japan, over in Japan. And we needed 90 gallons of fuel to get back to Iwo Jima. Somebody in the squadron called 90 gallons. I looked over. Phil was on my wing. I gave him a thumbs up. He gave me a thumbs up. And I led my flight of four airplanes into some very heavy weather towards the B-29 that we would fly on the wing back to Iwo Jima. And when I came out into the clear skies, he was gone. Just gone. There was no radio contact, no visual contact. And when we landed back on Iwo Jima, we found out that the moment that we had started the strafe, the war had already been over for three hours. It was never broadcast to us. We never heard of it. So that was a devastating day. He was the last of 400 plus thousand World War II veterans who gave their lives. He was the last, 19 years old. And you were 21? I was 21. I was the old guy. <laughs> the old guy, Grandpa. 
you just made res reference to a, a number of uh, uh, close friends and fellow pilots that were tragically killed either in combat or, or in flight accidents during World War II. You relay uh, several of those incidents in your book. How did the loss of, of so many affect you personally? Well, you have to understand that when you put the uniform on of the military or the policeman or the fireman, you dedicate your life to the protecting your buddies. And uh, when they go, you can't think about them as gone, as being dead or gone. Because if you did, you'd never fly another mission. You just wouldn't get into the airplane. So I had three wingmen that were killed. One guy on the 29th of May, Danny Mathis, and I shared a kill of a zero. I landed on Iwo Jima, I had a toothache. Dr. Lipschitz, the dentist from South Carolina, pulled four wisdom teeth and grounded me. And Danny Mathis was giving my place for a mission on June 1. The squadron took off, was led into a front. Uh, 27 fighter planes went down. 25 guys were killed, including Danny Mathis, on my airplane. And it's hard for me to tell you the truth of how I felt then, but I missed my airplane. I didn't miss theirs. We were there to protect our freedom. We were there to fight. We did that. It was after the war that I suffered for 30 years. I spoke to these guys every night, 16 guys that I flew with. I thought about suicide. I couldn't work. I suffered from what is now known as PTSD, post-traumatic stress and didn't get my life back until 1975 when I learned transcendental meditation, or not the meditation, breathing the stress. Combat is uh, killing of people for what they believe is evil, and that's the height of evil. We, Japan was evil, Germany was evil, Italy was evil. We fought against those countries, and I don't believe that I'm part of the greatest generation. General Eisenhower, General Marshall, General Arnold, General MacArthur, they were all West, West Point graduates. I was 18. I didn't know anything about the world, but Admiral Nimitz and Admiral King and Admiral Mitchell, all Annapolis graduates, they were the greatest generation. Tom Brokaw wrote a book speaking about us, catchy title, sold a lot of books, but really the leaders of our free world were the military men who served from West Point from Annapolis. Thank you for that perspective. Uh, the war ends in 1945. I think I heard you say downstairs you actually spent some time in the reserve uh, e uh, beyond the end of World War II. But then like millions of World War II veterans, you returned from the war, you started a whole new life in the, in the civilian world, the, the, that returning workforce and the, 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 the work ethic, the belief in freedom that you brought back to our society uh, really launched a, a, an incredible uh, period in American history. How did your military service prepare you for that new life and, uh, and what transpired after the war? I think that the military service for me was the greatest experience that I ever had in my life. Uh, we, uh, I graduated from high school in 1941. I had a scholarship to college. I was going to become a doctor, but I didn't have any money for books, didn't have any money for clothing or housing. So I postponed entrance to college to the spring semester of 1942. And when we were attacked, Pearl Harbor, December 7th, I made up my mind I was going to fly fighter planes against the Japanese. Uh, I remember when I was 11 or 12 years old, I was a pre-Boy Scout. I went to Boy Scout camp for two weeks, and that two weeks gave me the fundamentals to join the military and to be in the military. And uh, the discipline that we learned, we were all quarterbacks, all guys who were 
cocky guys who could fly fighter planes. You know, the bomber pilots weren't guys like that, but we were. And uh, we became a squadron. We became more interested in protecting our buddies than we were interested in our own lives. And our life was all about you. Today, I have six grandchildren. I have four sons. And it seems to me that today, life is all about me, not about you. And the military put me in that frame of mind of service to our country. Well, thank you for setting that standard for so many of us. You, you made reference to uh, some of the things you struggled with based on uh, your, your combat experience in World War II. Um, you're dealing with PTS, although we didn't have a name for it at the time. So how has your experience as a veteran impacted your life since? Your triumphs, your struggles, how have you used those experiences? I, uh, I enjoy speaking to people. I enjoy going to eighth graders, 10th graders, seniors in high school to talk about 10% of the population served in the military of World War II. 16 million of us served. Um, we fought against evil. We conquered the people who were evil. Created democracies in Germany, Japan, and Italy that exist today as friends of America, and the two countries that we fought with as allies, Russia and China, seemingly to me are the enemies of the world. But what I've learned is we're not the color of our skin, we're not the language we speak, we're not the religion that we believe, we're all human beings, all exactly the same. And we have to preserve that, that feeling. ISIS is evil today. They're willing to kill people for what they believe, and that's evil. We have to protect what which we do. You know, protect the freedom of people who believe that everyone is human beings. Everybody is part of humanity. And when I try to give that message, it's uh, probably the best time in my life, other than when the time when I was in uniform. And I wear the uniform proud of America. What, what would you say? We've got, uh, we've got several young people here. We've got, the, we've got the band, we've got the choir. There are several young people in our audience. Uh, I know some ROTC cadets, uh, the children of our chaplain, uh, others. What would you say to them today? Those who are, are at a point where they are considering or maybe simply have an opportunity to make a decision about serving our nation uh, as a member of the United States military. What would, what would you say to them? I, my mother used to read a lot of books. And 80 years ago, when I was 13 years old, I read a book by a minister called Lloyd Douglas. The book's name was The Magnificent Obsession. It's the story of a small town in Lake George in New York State where the richest, the son of the richest 20 or 21 year old boy was drowning and a beloved doctor, uh, Dr. Hudson, was dying of a heart attack. And the fire department had one resuscitator. They served the young man and the old doctor died. And then thousands and thousands of people came to his funeral. And his family discovered a journal that he could, that he had kept and had it translated from the code into English. The opening lines of that journal said, do something good for someone else every day of your life and tell no one what you did because by talking about it, you might lo lose the benefits that are new to you or are new to that other person. So I would suggest to everyone Find a way to help somebody. Find a way to do something for anybody. Somebody every day, even if it's a smile. Uh, the four professions that I admire in America are the three who put uniforms on. 
and the fourth teachers in schools who learn a subject and give themselves away in using that subject to give other people knowledge. And they're not as respected as I think they should be. But my, my feelings are that we should be giving a little bit of ourselves away to other people every, every single day. That's the advice that I would give to the younger people. So for you, I, I, what, what you just described is uh, uh, those of us who, who wear the uniform, uh, especially around Veterans Day, a lot of people will tell us thank you for your service. But what I hear you saying is service is what our lives should be about every single day, doing something for someone else. So service is not just military service. Service is how we should lead our lives. I, I believe that very much, sir. Um, we're all part of humanity. I think that the pure purpose of everything that is living on this earth, from trees to birds to fish, animals, is to recreate ourselves, to pass ourselves on. And uh, there's nothing or no one goes to recreation school. It all comes with the territory. And that territory has to be protected as fathers pass on to their sons mothers pass on to their daughters what's good in life and we need to, to keep doing that we might have lost some of it but that's to me that's what life is about wonderful uh, it, in a moment we're going to open it up to see if our audience has uh, any questions that they would like to ask you directly uh, any final thought you would like to share before we uh, open it up to the audience no the, 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 I I'm just proud to be an American and to continue. <laughs> and continue to wear this uniform proudly. And I can't tell you what an honor it is to me, for me, to be in this audience on this day in 2017. Um, I sort of live my life like my banker looks at a checking account. Yesterday's a canceled check, can't get that back anymore. Today's money in the bank, I can spend today. And Colonel Scott owes me a promissory note tomorrow, and I don't know if I'm going to get paid tomorrow. So today's the day, and, and I'm just thrilled to be here. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, we'd like to open up now to any questions that you may have for Captain Yellen. We have Mike Handler in our audience. If you have a question you'd like to ask him, if you could just please raise your hand and we'll get the microphone to you. We do have time for a couple of questions. Um, and please do, raise your hand. I will come to you with a microphone. But I'd like to ask a question of, of Captain Yellen. This is being broadcast um, really worldwide via Facebook and um, is being recorded by Seas fans. So we've got a very large audience. I know you said you suffered with PTSD for a number of years. What suggestion, what um, guidance might you give to somebody listening to this um, that would be in need of help? I was told that I had battle fatigue. Uh, the war was over and you can't forget about it. The, the veterans today, 20 or 22 commit suicide every day. Those who serve, they need something for themselves. We spend a lot for antidepressant, anti-psychotic uh, drugs, which is sometimes addictive. And we can teach transcendental meditation for $700 to a veteran, one-time fee for a lifetime of help. Uh, TM.org is uh, a website that they can find out about it. Uh, I still meditate twice a day, 20 minutes a day. I think it kept me alive, and it's keeping me alive. So I'm an advocate of that. You can't force it on anybody. It's something that's owned. Rem removes the stress of combat. It did it for me. It can do it for others. Center section, sir. Hello. Uh, yes, uh, my father-in-law, 94, World War II, flew uh, C-47, flew over the 
through the hump over the Himalayas from India to, uh, to uh, India. He's alive today and he does walk with a walker. And uh, today I sat with a very good friend of mine at a breakfast who's 95 years old and uh, flew combat in Italy. So they are still the 5% and uh, those of you who have not read the book, The Greatest Generation, need to read it. It's a wonderful book and thank you very much, sir. I appreciate that. Sir, in preparation and coming here, uh, read a little bit about uh, your life after the war and a little bit of uh, some reconciliation you made uh, through your family. And I don't know if you would take a moment just to share that. And uh, I know that's probably a, a long story, but I'd like for everyone to hear a little bit about that. In 1983, I was a consultant to major banks in California. And they asked me to go to Japan to speak to the Mitsui Bank Group. Well, I had been on Iwo Jima. You can, you can replicate the sights, you can replicate the sounds, but you can't replicate the smell of 28,000 bodies rotting in the sun. I had no use for the Japanese people. And I said, no, I can't go to Japan. I'm too busy. And I asked my, I told my wife when I came home that night that I turned down a trip to go to Japan. And she very quietly said, Jerry, you never once asked me if I wanted to go to Japan. So being a dutiful husband, in 1983, I found myself in Japan. And I was completely overwhelmed by the culture, the education, the food, the scenery, the people, everything. And my youngest of four sons was then a senior at San Diego State. And Helene said, we should give him a trip to Japan for a graduation present. We did that. He signed a contract in 1984 teach English in Japan for one year. And now it's 2017, and he hasn't come back yet. He's still there. In 1988, he married the daughter of a kamikaze pilot who hated me as much as I hated him. And we became friend and family. I have three Japanese, six grandchildren, three Japanese grandchildren. The oldest is 28. His name is Ken Taro. He has a master's in physics from the MIT of Japan. Hokkaido University, and uh, is one of 100 people who got a job from 23,000 applicants. His brother Simon, named Simon not after my father, but two Japanese characters, Sai and Mon, graduated from the University of City of London, a four-year course in philosophy, and was awarded a two-year course at Oxford to get a master's in philosophy which he graduated from in one year, and a 21-year-old gra granddaughter, Sarah. So my enemy is my family. My whole thought process of World War II was to kill Japanese, and now I have three grandchildren in Japan, family in Japan. And I found that that was the biggest learning experience that I could ever have. Uh, I wrote a book about that in 1988 called Of War, and weddings, it's, uh, I don't like to promote myself, but that's a book that you can read on Amazon. And I'm proud of them, I'm proud of the three grand American grandchildren, we're all the same, and my love for them. Off to your right, sir. We have, we have time for one last question, um, and we'll take that now, and then we'll hear from our choir and band the very dramatic Battle Hymn of the Republic. Afterwards, Jerry will be available to autograph copies of his book in the front lobby, which are available in our store. Our last question. Uh, thank you, sir, for your service, and everybody out here, thank you very much for uh, keeping us safe in America. Um, have you flown anything since your time behind the 51? Have you ever maybe even gotten a jet and experienced that? And having parents both in the Navy, I have to really quickly say, go Navy, beat Army. <laughs> well, you know, you never lose the ability to make loves unless you get old. 
And you really never lose the ability to fly. I flew in uh, a Stearman in Phoenix uh, two days ago. Um, I flew a T6, the new T6, a 12 or 1400 horsepower uh, trainer at Laughlin Air Force Base in December. And uh, I'm going back to Phoenix in January to get a ride in an F-16. Uh, they have a, a very small club of, of pilots today, fighter pilots, called the 9G Club. They pull 9Gs in an F-16. I'm not going to let them do that. <laughs> I don't think I'll make it through. But. He left out one small detail. He not only flew the T-6 at Laughlin Air Force Base in Texas, he actually landed it. I, I, I don't know how I got to be this age. I guess I have good genes, but I, I genuinely feel I'm in the prime of life right now, and to be here be with you, sir, and to be with the Marine Colonel and Chaplain and, and the audience is one of the thrills and honors of my life. Thank you very much. Sir, thank you very much. <laughs> Wayne, Captain Yellen, thank you. We will conclude with the Battle Hymn of the Republic.
Ladies and gentlemen, here be appropriate one more round of applause for these wonderful young people who have shared their musical talents with us today. The Villa Park High School Concert Ensemble led by Chuck Jay and the Orange High School Concert Choir led by Mike Shea. Before we close, I would like to uh, once again highlight an upcoming event here at the Nixon Library on Sunday, December 3rd at noon here in the East Room. The Nixon Foundation will host the 8th Annual Honoring Hometown Heroes event where we recognize those whom have given their lives in military service from across Southern California and their families. This is the largest event of its kind in Southern California honoring Gold Star families and we invite you to attend and join us in honoring them. As our ceremony concludes, uh, as Chris mentioned, Captain Yellen will be out in our front lobby signing copies of his book, The Last Fighter Pilot. If you would like to read an absolutely fascinating account of World War II in the Pacific by this incredible warrior, I highly recommend you purchase a copy of our book. It's available in the bookstore next uh, out by our entrance. This concludes our program today. Thank you for being here. God bless our veterans, and God bless the United States of America. Thank you. Thank you.